This is part two of my Temple Square evangelism report from last night. I spoke with Connor and Emma from Verbal, sorry, Vernal, Utah. They are siblings. They had both served LDS missions. Connor returned early and is ready to return. It might have been a health issue. I asked them, what is the most important teaching of the LDS church? And Connor's answer was, the power of the priesthood to heal <clears throat> and to perform miracles. They described experiences of prayer and blessings where God had healed family members and friends. So I asked, do you think God answers such prayers outside the LDS church? Yes, they said, but only those in the LDS church have the true priesthood. Emma's answer was, this is to the question of what's the most important teaching of the LDS Church. Her answer was to be with her family forever through temple ceilings. I offered to explain how Christians think about both of these. Regarding healing, I chose not to address the priesthood issue. That would require more time. Rather, I simply said, God is so good. He loves widows. He loves orphans. He loves the destitute. He loves the sick. He loves to answer prayer. He's generous. He's good. He feeds the sparrows. How much more will he provide for humans? He clothes the lilies of the fields. How much more will he clothe his image bearers with glory? Regarding being with one's family forever, I explained that the most important sealing relationship that we can have is with Jesus Christ. Christians call this union with Christ, or related, adoption, or being in Christ. Paul uses that preposition, to be in Christ. It is a secure, permanent bond. And we receive this sealing by Christ, with Christ, the sealing with Christ by faith. It is a gift freely received. And when I am united or sealed to Christ, I am by extension immediately united to all those who are united to Christ. Put another way, by being sealed to Christ by faith, I am by extension sealed to all those who are sealed to Christ. I am in a forever family with all Christians, even throughout all time. And I will be with them forever in heaven and the resurrection. Side note, I like to uh, package those together in heaven and at the resurrection. Heaven uh, and the resurrection are both part of our future as Christians. The best thing about heaven will be the personal dwelling and presence of Jesus Christ. Anything apart from his presence is an awful hell, an eternal punishment. There's no happiness, no joy to be had in dwelling in a separate kingdom from Christ. Connor caught on to what I was saying on this last point and conceded that the telestial and terrestrial kingdoms, though apart from Christ, were, to paraphrase, not as happy as they could be. So uh, Mormonism has this confused and uh, uh, well, kind of a conflicted doctrine uh, about um, whether or not the bottom two kingdoms of heaven are in eternal punishment or are they the kind of joyous glory that, you know, that's sort of the folk Mormon ideas. If you knew how wonderful the bottom heavenly celestial kingdom was, you would want to commit suicide to get there. That's not uh, so much an authoritative teaching as just a common thing we hear from Mormon missionaries. We then talked about, I'm sorry, <clears throat> I'm not sure how we transitioned from that. Uh, I don't remember all the conversation. But I then shared the gospel with them by recounting how I had just shared it with an agnostic. So uh, my way of getting to the gospel, at least in this conversation, was to just tell them the story of how I had just shared the gospel with uh, somebody else, uh, an agnostic. It's nice to bring a third party in. It's not just me, the Christian uh, uh, talking to, say, a Mormon. I'm, I'm, I, have a, I have a message that's common, uh, essentially, for all who uh, 
uh, would, would hear it, no matter their background. I shared the gospel with them by recounting how I just shared it with an agnostic. We walked through sin, the cross, the resurrection, and the gospel of grace. We then talked, again, I don't remember how we transitioned, about whether God has an ancestry of God's. They insisted that this was only speculative and that its truth was unknown, <clears throat> that someday we would know more about it, it's too deep. I replied that Christians are not unsure about this. We worship the original, the first, the ultimate, the most high God. This is not too deep to affirm. It might be too deep to comprehend and wrap our heads around. It is, but it's not too deep to affirm. It is a beautiful truth that Christians have always affirmed and confessed together. It's something we teach our kids. It's not something to put on a shelf. It's something to put our faith in. Just like we can reject the earth regional deities of the ancient Near East, we can reject the cosmic regional deities of Mormonism. Uh, <clears throat> so in Mormonism, if you zoom out, and if you're, if you're looking at Mormonism through the lens of what the prophets have taught, you have a family tree of the gods, and each of the exalted gods has under them uh, worlds without number. So I explained that, um, you know, just like in the Old Testament, God said he was not a God without boundaries. He was the God over all. He was the creator. Uh, there's, no, there's no part of the earth that isn't under his jurisdiction. He's not a regional deity. Uh, just like we can say that God is not an earth regional deity, we can also say that God is not a cosmic regional deity. So Mormonism just zooms out and says, that this uh, universe, or perhaps this uh, part of the multiverse, a subset of worlds, uh, is under this particular god that is over this branch of the family tree of the gods. But there's other worlds out there under other gods. So I explain that for Christians. There's no edge. There's no border. Uh, there's no sign that says, the worlds beyond this boundary belong to another god. You, you are entering the, the cosmic territory of another God. There's no road sign for a city where our God does not reign. I asked if I could show them a Bible verse. So I just said, may I show you a Bible verse? And they cheerfully agreed. So I pulled out my ridiculously large grandpa eyes Bible. If you saw this, you would, uh, you would think this was ridiculous how big. I mean, you, you've seen big... This is bigger than the big Bible you've seen. This kind of makes for a light moment. It's, it's a cheerful moment. I, they say, well, that's huge. And I explain, I got this because uh, sometimes I'm under uh, maybe the faint street light of Salt Lake City. And uh, in the past, I've had my phone and the flashlights. This is, just makes it easier to follow along on the street. So it's useful at night. So I put my finger under Isaiah 43.10 and Isaiah 44, verse 6, Before me no God was formed, neither shall there be any after me. I am the first, and I am the last. Besides me there is no God. Connor, who had been quite courteous, became stern at this point. He said that this was addressing, again, deep doctrine, and that God means for his people to learn line upon line, precept upon precept, and that we were not ready to discuss or to know about whether God had gods before him. I replied that saying that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young had been quite clear about this topic. I encouraged him to look at the King Follett Discourse by Joseph Smith and the Sermon in the Grove, as, as it's called by Joseph Smith. It's not, I think it's not called the Sermon in the Grove by Joseph Smith, but the sermon is by Joseph Smith. In these sermons, Joseph Smith teaches that we can become gods, as all the gods have done before us, and that God himself has not always been God. In the Sermon on the Grove, he teaches that God the Father has a father. And Brigham Young takes this and he runs with it. So does Wilfred Woodruff. I told him that what I had to say was not from some fringe Christian movement. I stand in solidarity with all Christians throughout all time, uh, throughout all of Christian history, I should say. 
in calling our beloved neighbors to faith and repentance. Repentance from worshiping a regional deity and faith uh, in the most high God, to worship the, the very first, the very original, most high God. He looked quite agitated at this, so I ended by encouraging him and his sister. I said, if there's ever a time in their future where they become disillusioned with Joseph Smith, that they should look to Jesus Christ as a solid and durable foundation. I made mention of the fact, and they conceded that many in Utah are leaving Mormonism. And uh, Emma t said that, uh, I think she had read a stat that over 80% of people who leave Mormonism uh, leave any notion of, of uh, uh, Christ or the Bible or Christianity, uh, at least 80%, right? So I encouraged them that Christ was a solid uh, and durable foundation. I said, fall back on Christ. And then I said, and he's much more than a fallback. He's a foundation. Jesus says, if you hear his words and do them, you will be like a man who builds his house on a solid rock. So when the storm comes and the waves come, you won't be washed away, blown over. Uh, you'll be stable. I also said that there were churches available to them in Utah that would patiently and kindly and eagerly take them in and teach them the simplicity of knowing Christ as all-sufficient. We like to say, Jesus is enough. They ended at this point by sharing their testimonies of the LDS Church and the Book of Mormon. They were firm and emotional. But this is not a rhetorical battle. This is about planting seeds. So I was happy to let them have the last word I shook their hands and I thanked them for talking. I said, thank you for talking with me. I know I'm just some random guy in the street. It's late. I had my daughter and her friend behind me. There was, they were maybe like 15 feet over uh, just being silly teenage girls talking amongst themselves. Um, but I said, thank you for talking with me and being kind. And, and uh, they, they reciprocated and they left. So you could pray for them. It's, uh, Connor and Emma. It sounds like the team we were with from Chicago had a very good time and they debriefed meaningful interactions. For many of them, this was their very first time doing stranger evangelism. Grace and peace to you.